Section 60 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 60. Chapter 49, Part 3 James, unable to resist so strong a combination as that of his people, his parliament, his son, and his favorite, had been compelled to embrace measures for which, from temper as well as judgment, he had ever entertained a most settled aversion. Though he dissembled his resentment, he began to estrangle himself from Buckingham, to whom he ascribed all those violent counsels and whom he considered as the author both of the prince's journey to spain and of the breach of the marriage treaty the arrival of bristol he impatiently longed for and it was by the assistance of that minister whose wisdom he respected and whose views he approved that he hoped in time to extricate himself from his present difficulties during the prince's abode in Spain, that able negotiator had ever opposed, though unsuccessfully, to the impetuous measures suggested by Buckingham, his own wise and well-tempered counsels. After Charles' departure, he still, upon the first appearance of a change of resolution, interposed his advice, and strenuously insisted on the sincerity of the Spaniards in the conduct of the treaty as well as the advantages which England much reap from the completion of it. Enraged to find that his successful labors should be rendered abortive by the levities and caprices of an insolent minion, he would understand no hints, and nothing but express orders from his master could engage him to make that demand which, he was sensible, must put a final period to the treaty. He was not, therefore, surprised to hear that Buckingham had declared himself his open enemy, and on all occasions had thrown out many violent reflections against him. Nothing could be of greater consequence to Buckingham than to keep Bristol at a distance both from the king and the parliament, lest the power of truth, enforced by so well-informed a speaker, should open scenes which were but suspected by the former and of which the latter had as yet entertained no manner of jealousy. He applied, therefore, to James, whose weakness, disguised to himself under the appearance of finesse and dissimulation, was now become absolutely incurable. A warrant for sending Bristol to the Tower was issued immediately upon his arrival in England, and though he was soon released from confinement, yet orders were carried him from the king to retire to his country seat and to abstain from all attendance in Parliament. He obeyed, but loudly demanded an opportunity of justifying himself, and of laying his whole conduct before his master. On all occasions he protested his innocence, and threw on his enemy the blame of every miscarriage. Buckingham, and, at his instigation, the prince, declared that they would be reconciled to Bristol, if he would but acknowledge his errors and ill-conduct. But the spirited nobleman, jealous of his honor, refused to buy favor at so high a price. James had the equity to say that the insisting on that condition was a strain of unexampled tyranny, but Buckingham scrupled not to assert, with his usual presumption, that neither the king, the prince, nor himself were as yet satisfied of Bristol's innocence. While the attachment of the prince to Buckingham, while the timidity of James, or the shame of changing his favorite, kept the whole court in awe, the Spanish ambassador, in Oyosa, endeavored to open the king's eyes, and to cure his fears by instilling greater fears into him. He privately slipped into his hand a paper, and gave him a signal to read it alone. He there told him that he was as much a prisoner at London as ever Francis I was at Madrid that the prince and Buckingham had conspired together, and had the whole court at their devotion, that cables among the popular leaders in Parliament were carrying on, to the extreme prejudice of his authority, that the project was to confine him to some of his hunting seats, and to commit the whole administration to Charles. 
and that it was necessary for him, by one vigorous effort, to vindicate his authority, and to punish those who had so long and so much abused his friendship and beneficence. What credit James gave to this representation does not appear. He only discovered some faint symptoms, which he instantly retracted, of dissatisfaction with Buckingham. All his public measures, and all the alliances into which he entered, were founded on the system of enmity to the Austrian family, and of war to be carried on for the recovery of the Palatinate. The state of the United Provinces were at this time governed by Maurice and that aspiring prince, sensible that his credit would languish during peace, had, on the expiration of the twelve years' truce, renewed the war with the Spanish monarchy. His great capacity in the military art would have compensated the inferiority of his forces, had not the Spanish armies been commanded by Spinola, a general equally renowned for conduct, and more celebrated for enterprise and activity. In such a situation, nothing could be more welcome to the Republic than the prospect of a rupture between James and the Catholic King, and they flattered themselves, as well from the natural union of interests between them and England, as from the influence of the present conjuncture, that powerful succors would soon march to their relief. Accordingly, an army of six thousand men was levied in England, and sent over to Holland, commanded by four young noblemen. Essex, Oxford, Southampton, and Willoughby, who were ambitious of distinguishing themselves in so popular a cause, and of acquiring military experience under so renowned a captain as Maurice. It might reasonably have been expected that, as religious zeal had made the recovery of the Palatinate appear a point of such vast importance in England, the same effect must have been produced in France by the force merely of political views and considerations. While that principality remained in the hands of the House of Austria, the French dominions were surrounded on all sides by the possessions of that ambitious family, and might be invaded by superior forces from every quarter. It concerned the King of France, therefore, to prevent the peaceable establishment of the Emperor in his new conquests, and both by the situation and greater power of his state, he was much better enabled than James to give succor to the distressed Palatine. Notwithstanding the sensible experience which James might have acquired of this unsurmountable antipathy entertained by his subjects against an alliance with Catholics, he still persevered in the opinion that his son would be degraded by receiving into his bed a princess of less than royal extraction. After the rupture, therefore, with Spain, nothing remained but an alliance with France and to that court he immediately applied himself. The same allurements had not here place, which had so long entangled him in the Spanish negotiation. The portion promised was much inferior, and the peaceable restoration of the Palatine could not thence be expected. But James was afraid lest his son should be altogether disappointed of a bride, and therefore, as soon as the French king demanded, for the honor of his crown, the same terms which had been granted to the Spanish, he was prevailed with to comply. And as the prince, during his abode in Spain, had given a verbal promise to allow the infanta the education of her children till the age of thirteen, this article was here inserted into the treaty, and to that imprudence is generally imputed the present distressed condition of his posterity. The court of England, however, it must be confessed, always pretended, even in the memorials to the French court, that all the favorable conditions granted to the Catholics were inserted in the marriage treaty merely to please the Pope, and that their strict execution was, by an agreement with France, secretly dispensed with. As much as the conclusion of the marriage treaty was acceptable to the king, as much were all the military enterprises disagreeable, both from the extreme difficulty of the undertaking in which he was engaged, and from his own incapacity for such a scene of action. During the Spanish negotiation, Heidelberg and Mannheim had been taken by the imperial forces, and Frankendale, though the garrison was entirely English, was closely besieged by them. After reiterated remonstrances from James, Spain interposed, and procured a suspension of arms during eighteen months. But as Frankendale was the only place of Frederick's ancient dominions which was still in his hands, 
Ferdinand, desirous of withdrawing his forces from the Palatinate, and of leaving that state in security, was unwilling that so important a fortress should remain in the possession of the enemy. To compromise all differences, it was agreed to sequestrate it into the hands of the Infanta as a neutral person, upon condition that, after the expiration of the truce, it should be delivered to Frederick, though peace should not, at that time, be concluded between him and Ferdinand. After the unexpected rupture with Spain, the Infanta, when James demanded the execution of the treaty, offered him peaceable possession of Frankendale, and even promised a safe conduct for the garrison to the Spanish Netherlands. But there was some territory of the empire interposed between her state and the Palatinate, and for passage over that territory no terms were stipulated. By this chicane, which certainly had not been employed if amity with Spain had been preserved, the Palatine was totally dispossessed of his patrimonial dominions. The English nation, however, and James's warlike council were not discouraged. It was still determined to reconquer the Palatinate, a state lying in the midst of Germany, possessed entirely by the Emperor and Duke of Bavaria, surrounded by potent enemies and cut off from all communication with England. Count Mansfeld was taken into pay, and an English army of 12,000 foot and 200 horse was levied by a general press throughout the kingdom. During the negotiation with France, vast promises had been made, though in general terms, by the French ministry. Not only that a free passage should be granted to the English troops, but that powerful succors should also join them in their march towards the Palatinate. In England, all these professions were hastily interpreted to be positive engagements. The troops under Manfelt's command were embarked at Dover, but upon sailing over to Calais, found no orders yet arrived for their admission. After waiting in vain during some time, they were obliged to sail towards Zealand, where it had also been neglected to concert proper measures for their disembarkation, and some scruples arose among the states on account of the scarcity of provisions. Meanwhile, a pestilential distemper crept in among the English forces so long cooped up in narrow vessels. Half the army died while on board, and the other half, weakened by sickness, appeared too small a body to march into the Palatinate. And thus ended this ill-concerted and fruitless expedition, the only disaster which happened to England during the prosperous and pacific reign of James. That reign was now drawing towards a conclusion. With peace so successfully cultivated, and so passionately loved by this monarch, his life also terminated. This spring he was seized with a tertian ague, and when encouraged by his courtiers with the common proverb that such a distemper during that season was health for a king, he replied that the proverb was meant of a young king. After some fits, he found himself extremely weakened, and sent for the prince, whom he extorted to bear a tender affection for his wife, but to preserve a constancy in religion, to protect the Church of England, and to extend his care toward the unhappy family of the Palatine. With decency and courage he prepared himself for his end, and he expired on the 27th of March, after a reign over England of twenty-two years and some days, and in the fifty-ninth year of his age. His reign over Scotland was almost of equal duration with his life, in all history, it would be difficult to find a reign less illustrious, yet more unspotted and unblemished, than that of James in both kingdoms. No prince, so little enterprising and so inoffensive, was ever so much exposed to the opposite extremes of calumny and flattery, of satire and panegyric, and the factions which began in his time, being still continued, have made his character be as much disputed to this day as is commonly that of princes who are our contemporaries. Many virtues, however, it must be owned, he was possessed of, but scarcely any of them pure or free from the contagion of the neighboring vices. His generosity bordered on profusion, his learning on pedantry, his pacific disposition on pusillanimity, his wisdom on cunning, his friendship on light fancy and boyish fondness. While he imagined that he was only maintaining his own authority, 
he may, perhaps, be suspected, in a few of his actions, and still more of his pretensions, to have somewhat encroached on the liberties of his people, while he endeavored, by an exact neutrality, to acquire the goodwill of all his neighbors, he was able to preserve fully the esteem and regard of none. His capacity was considerable, but fitter to discourse on general maxims than to conduct any intricate business. His intentions were just, but more adapted to the conduct of private life than to the government of kingdoms. Awkward in his person and ungainly in his manners, he was ill-qualified to command respect. Partial and undiscerning in his affections, he was little fitted to acquire general love. Of a feeble temper, more than of a frail judgment. Exposed to our ridicule from his vanity, but exempt from our hatred by his freedom from pride and arrogance. And, upon the whole, it may be pronounced of his character that all his qualities were sullied with weakness and embellished by humanity. Of political courage he certainly was destitute, and thence, chiefly, is derived the strong prejudice which prevails against his personal bravery. An inference, however, which must be owned, from general experience, to be extremely fallacious. He was only once married, to Anne of Denmark, who died on the 3rd of March, 1619, in the 45th year of her age, a woman eminent neither for her vices nor her virtues. She loved shows and expensive amusements, but possessed little taste in her pleasures. A great comet appeared about the time of her death, and the vulgar esteemed it the prognostic of that event. So considerable in their eyes are even the most insignificant princes. He left only one son, Charles, then in the twenty-fifth year of his age, and one daughter, Elizabeth, married to the elector Palatine. She was aged twenty-nine years. Those alone remained of six legitimate children born to him. He never had any illegitimate, and he never discovered any tendency, even the smallest, toward a passion for any mistress. The archbishops of Canterbury during this reign were Whitgift, who died in 1604, Bancroft in 1610, Abbott, who survived the king, the chancellors, Lord Ellismore, who resigned in 1617, Bacon was first Lord Keeper till 1619, then was created Chancellor, and was displaced in 1621. Williams, Bishop of Lincoln, was created Lord Keeper in his place. The High Treasurers were the Earl of Dorset, who died in 1609, the Earl of Salisbury in 1612, the Earl of Suffolk, fined and displaced for bribery in 1618. Lord Mandeville resigned in 1621 the Earl of Middlesex, displaced in 1624. The Earl of Marlborough succeeded. The Lord Admirals were the Earl of Nottingham, who resigned in 1618, the Earl, afterward Duke of Buckingham. The Secretaries of State were the Earl of Salisbury, Sir Ralph Winwood, Nanton, Calvert, Lord Conway, Sir Albertus Morton. The number of the House of Lords in the first Parliament of this reign were seventy-eight temporal peers. The numbers in the first Parliament of Charles were ninety-seven. Consequently, James, during that period, created nineteen new peerages above those that expired. The House of Commons in the first Parliament of this reign consisted of four hundred and sixty-seven members. It appears that four boroughs revived their charters, which they had formerly neglected and as the first Parliament of Charles consisted of 494 members, we may infer that James created 10 new boroughs. End of Section 60, Chapter 49, Part 3of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 61, Appendix to the Reign of James I, Part 1. 
it may not be improper at this period to make a pause and to take a survey of the state of the kingdom with regard to government, manners, finances, arms, trade, learning. Where a just notion is not formed of these particulars, history can be little instructive and often will not be intelligible. We may safely pronounce that the English government at the accession of the Scottish line was much more arbitrary than it is at present, the prerogative less limited, the liberties of the subject less accurately defined and secured. Without mentioning other particulars, the courts alone of High Commission and Star Chamber were sufficient to lay the whole kingdom at the mercy of the prince. The court of High Commission had been erected by Elizabeth in consequence of an act of Parliament passed in the beginning of her reign. By this act it was thought proper, during the great revolution of religion, to arm the sovereign with full powers, in order to discourage and suppress opposition. All appeals from the inferior ecclesiastical courts were carried before the High Commission, and, of consequence, the whole life and doctrine of the clergy lay directly under its inspection. Every breach of the act of uniformity, every refusal of the ceremonies, was cognizable in this court, and during the reign of Elizabeth had been punished by deprivation, by fine, confiscation, and imprisonment. James contented himself with the gentler penalty of deprivation, nor was that punishment inflicted with rigor on every offender. Archbishop Spotswood tells us that fee was informed by Bancroft, the primate, several years after the king's accession that not above forty-five clergymen had then been deprived. All the Catholics, too, were liable to be punished by this court if they exercised any act of their religion or sent abroad their children or other relatives to receive that education which they could not procure them in their own country. Popish priests were thrown into prison and might be delivered over to the law, which punished them with death, though that severity had been sparingly exercised by Elizabeth, and never almost by James. In a word, that liberty of conscience, which we so highly and so justly value at present, was totally suppressed, and no exercise of any religion but the established was permitted throughout the kingdom. Any word or writing which tended towards heresy or schism was punishable by the high commissioners or any three of them, they alone were judges what expression had that tendency. They proceeded not by information, but upon rumor, suspicion, or according to their discretion. They administered an oath by which the party cited before them was bound to answer any question which should be propounded to him. Whoever refused this oath, though he pleaded ever so justly, that he might thereby be brought to accuse himself or his dearest friend, was punishable by imprisonment, and in short, an inquisitional tribunal, with all its terrors and iniquities, was erected in the kingdom. Full discretionary powers were bestowed with regard to the inquiry, trial, sentence, and penalty inflicted, excepting only that corporal punishments were restrained by that patent of the prince, which erected the court, not by the act of parliament which empowered him, by reason of the uncertain limits which separate ecclesiastical from civil causes, all accusations of adultery and incest were tried by the court of high commission, and every complaint of wives against their husbands was there examined and discussed. On like pretenses, every cause which regarded conscience, that is, every cause, could have been brought under their jurisdiction but there was a sufficient reason why the king would not be solicitous to stretch the jurisdiction of this court. The Star Chamber possessed the same authority in civil matters, and in methods of proceeding were equally arbitrary and unlimited. The origin of this court was derived from the most remote antiquity, though it is pretended that its powers had first been carried to the greatest height by Henry the Seventh. In all times, however, it is confessed it enjoyed authority, and, 
at no time was its authority circumscribed or method of proceeding directed by any law or statute. We have already, or shall have sufficient occasion, during the course of this history, to mention the dispensing power, the power of imprisonment, of exacting loans and benevolences, of pressing and quartering soldiers, of altering the customs, of erecting monopolies. These branches of power, if not directly opposite to the principles of all free government, must at least be acknowledged dangerous to freedom in a monarchical constitution, where an eternal jealousy must be preserved against the sovereign, and no discretionary powers must ever be entrusted to him, by which the property or personal liberty of any subject can be affected. The kings of England, however, had almost constantly exercised these powers, and if, on any occasion, the prince had been obliged to submit to laws enacted against them, he had ever in practice eluded these laws, and returned to the same arbitrary administration. During almost three centuries before the accession of James, the regal authority in these particulars had never once been called in question. We may also observe that the principles, in general, which prevailed during that age, were so favorable to the monarchy, that they bestowed on it an authority almost absolute and unlimited, sacred and indefeasible. The meetings of Parliament were so precarious, their sessions so short, compared to the vacations, that when men's eyes were turned upwards in search of sovereign power, the prince alone was apt to strike them as the only permanent magistrate, invested with the whole majesty and authority of the state. The great complacence, too, of parliaments during so long a period had extremely degraded and obscured those assemblies and as all instances of opposition to prerogative must have been drawn from a remote age they were unknown to a great many and had the less authority even with those men who were acquainted with them these examples besides of liberty had commonly in ancient times been accompanied with such circumstances of violence convulsion civil war and disorder that they presented but a disagreeable idea to the inquisitive part of the people and afforded small inducement to renew such dismal scenes by a great many therefore monarchy simple and unmixed was conceived to be the government of england and those popular assemblies were supposed to form only the ornament of the fabric without being in any degree essential to its being and existence the prerogative of the crown was represented by lawyers as something real and durable, like those eternal essences of the schools which no time or force could alter. The sanction of religion was by divines called in aid, and the monarch of heaven was supposed to be interested in supporting the authority of his earthly vice-regent. And though it is pretended that these doctrines were more openly inculcated and more strenuously insisted on during the reign of the Stuarts, they were not then invented, and were found by the court to be more necessary at that period, by reason of the opposite doctrines which began to be promulgated by the Puritanical party. In consequence of these exalted ideas of kingly authority, the prerogative, besides the articles of jurisdiction founded on precedent, was by many supposed to possess an inexhaustible fund of latent powers, which might be exerted on any emergence. In every government, necessity, when real, supersedes all laws and levels all limitations. But in the English government, convenience alone was conceived to authorize any extraordinary act of regal power, and to render it obligatory on the people. Hence the strict obedience required to proclamations during all periods of the English history, and if James had incurred blame on account of his edicts, it is only because he too frequently issued them at a time when they began to be less regarded, not because he first assumed or extended to an unusual degree that exercise of authority. Of his maxims in a parallel case, the following is a pretty remarkable instance. Queen Elizabeth had appointed commissioners 
for the inspection of prisons and had bestowed on them full discretionary powers to adjust all differences between prisoners and their creditors to compound debts and to give liberty to such debtors as they found honest and insolvent from the uncertain undefined nature of the english constitution doubts sprang up in many that this commission was contrary to law and it was represented in that light to james he forbore therefore renewing the commission till the fifteenth of his reign when complaints rose so high with regard to the abuses practised in prisons that he thought himself obliged to overcome his scruples and to appoint new commissioners invested with the same discretionary powers which elizabeth had formerly conferred upon the whole we must conceive that monarchy on the accession of the house of stuart was possessed of a very extensive authority an authority in the judgment of all not exactly limited in the judgment of some not limitable but at the same time this authority was founded merely on the opinion of the people influenced by ancient precedent and example it was not supported either by money or by force of arms and for this reason we need not wonder that the princes of that line were so extremely jealous of their prerogative being sensible that when these claims were ravished from them they possessed no influence by which they could maintain their dignity or support the laws by the changes which have since been introduced the liberty and independence of individuals has been rendered much more full entire and secure that of the public more uncertain and precarious and it seems a necessary though perhaps a melancholy truth that in every government the magistrate must either possess a large revenue and a military force or enjoy some discretionary powers in order to execute the laws and support his own authority we have had occasion to remark in so many instances the bigotry which prevailed in that age that we can look for no toleration among the different sects two arians under the title of heretics were punished by fire during this period and no other reign since the reformation had been free from the like barbarities stowe says that these arians were offered their pardon at the stake if they would merit it by a recantation a madman who called himself the holy ghost was without any indulgence for his frenzy condemned to the same punishment twenty pounds a month could by law be levied on every one who frequented not the established worship this rigorous law however had one indulgent clause that the fines exacted should not exceed two-thirds of the yearly income of the person it had been usual for elizabeth to allow those penalties to run on for several years and to levy them all at once to the utter ruin of such catholics as had incurred her displeasure james was more humane in this as in every other respect the puritans formed a sect which secretly lurked in the church but pretended not to any separate worship or discipline an attempt of that kind would have been universally regarded as the most unpardonable enormity and had the king been disposed to grant the puritans a full toleration for a separate exercise of their religion it is certain from the spirit of the times that this sect itself would have despised and hated him for it and would have reproached him with lukewarmness and indifference to the cause of religion they maintained that they themselves were the only pure church that their principles and practices ought to be established by law and that no other ought to be tolerated it may be questioned therefore whether the administration at this time could with propriety deserve the appellation of persecutors with regard to the puritans such of the clergy indeed as refused to comply with the legal ceremonies were deprived of their livings and sometimes in elizabeth's reign were otherwise punished and ought any man to accept an office or benefice in an establishment while he declines compliance with the fixed and known rules of that establishment but puritans were never punished for frequenting separate congregations because there were none such in the kingdom and no protestant ever assumed or pretended 
to the right of erecting them. The greatest well-wishers of the Puritanical sect would have condemned a practice which, in that age, was universally, by statesmen and ecclesiastics, philosophers, and zealots, regarded as subversive of civil society. Even so great a reasoner as Lord Bacon thought that uniformity in religion was absolutely necessary to the support of government, and that no toleration could with safety be given to sectaries. Nothing but the imputation of idolatry, which was thrown on the Catholic religion, could justify in the eyes of the Puritans themselves the schism made by the Huguenots and other Protestants who lived in Popish countries. In all former ages, not wholly excepting even those of Greece and Rome, religious sects and heresies and schisms had been esteemed dangerous, if not pernicious, to civil government, and were regarded as the source of faction and private combination and opposition to the laws. The magistrate, therefore, applied himself directly to the cure of this evil, as of every other, and very naturally attempted by penal statutes to suppress those separate communities and punish the obstinate innovators. But it was found by fatal experience, and after spilling an ocean of blood in those theological quarrels, that the evil was of a peculiar nature and was both inflamed by violent remedies and diffused itself more rapidly throughout the whole society. Hence, though late, arose the paradoxical principle and salutary practice of toleration. The liberty of the press was incompatible with such maxims and such principles of government as then prevailed, and was therefore quite unknown in that age. Besides employing the two terrible courts of Star Chamber and High Commission, whose powers were unlimited, Queen Elizabeth exerted her authority by restraints upon the press. She passed a decree in her court of Star Chamber, that is, by her own will and pleasure, forbidding any book to be printed in any place but in London, Oxford, and Cambridge, and another in which she prohibited, under severe penalties, the publishing of any book or pamphlet against the form or meaning of any restraint or ordinance contained or to be contained in any statute or laws of this realm, or in any injunction made or set forth by Her Majesty or Her Privy Council, or against the true sense or meaning of any letters, patent, commissions, or prohibitions under the Great Seal of England. James extended the same penalties to the importing of such books from abroad. And to render these edicts more effectual, he afterwards inhibited the printing of any book without a license from the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London, or the Vice-Chancellor of one of the universities, or some person appointed by them. In tracing the coherence among the systems of modern theology, we may observe that the doctrine of absolute decrees has ever been intimately connected with the enthusiastic spirit, as that doctrine affords the highest subject of joy, triumph, and security to the supposed elect, and exalts them by infinite degrees above the rest of mankind. All the first reformers adopted these principles, and the Jansenists too, a fanatical sect in France, not to mention the Mohammedans in Asia, have ever embraced them. As the Lutheran establishments were subjected to Episcopal jurisdiction, their enthusiastic genius gradually decayed, and men had leisure to perceive the absurdity of supposing God to punish by infinite torments what he himself from all eternity had unchangeably decreed. The king, though at this time his Calvinistic education had riveted him in the doctrine of absolute decrees, yet being a zealous partisan of episcopacy, was insensibly engaged towards the end of his reign to favor the milder theology of Arminius. Even in so great a doctor, the genius of the religion prevailed over its speculative tenets, and with him the whole clergy gradually dropped the more rigid principles of absolute reprobation and unconditional decrees. Some noise was at first made about these innovations, but being drowned in the fury of factions and civil wars which ensued, 
the scholastic arguments made an insignificant figure amidst those violent disputes about civil and ecclesiastical power with which the nation was agitated. At the Restoration, the Church, though she still retained her old subscriptions and articles of faith, was found to have totally changed her speculative doctrines, and to have embraced tenets more suitable to the genius of her discipline and worship, without it being possible to assign the precise period in which the alteration was produced. It may be worth observing that James, from his great desire to promote controversial divinity, erected a college at Chelsea for the entertainment of twenty persons who should be entirely employed in refuting the Papists and Puritans. All the efforts of the great Bacon could not procure an establishment for the cultivation of natural philosophy. Even to this day no society has been instituted for the polishing and fixing of our language. The only encouragement which the sovereign in England has ever given to anything that has the appearance of science was this short-lived establishment of James, an institution quite superfluous considering the unhappy propension which at that time so universally possessed the nation for polemical theology. End of section 61. Appendix to the Reign of James I, Part 1. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 62 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1D, Section 62. Appendix of the Reign of James I, Part 2. The manners of the nation were agreeable to the monarchical government which prevailed, and contained not that strange mixture which at present distinguishes England from all other countries. Such violent extremes were then unknown of industry and debauchery, frugality and profusion, civility and rusticity, fanaticism and skepticism, Candor, sincerity, modesty are the only qualities which the English of that age possessed in common with the present. High pride of family then prevailed, and it was by a dignity and stateliness of behavior that the gentry and nobility distinguished themselves from the common people. Great riches acquired by commerce were more rare and had not as yet been able to confound all ranks of men, and render money the chief foundation of distinction. Much ceremony took place in the common intercourse of life, and little familiarity was indulged by the great. The advantages which result from opulence are so solid and real, that those who are possessed of them need not dread the near approaches of their inferiors. The distinctions of birth and title being more empty and imaginary, soon vanish upon familiar access and acquaintance. The expenses of the great consisted in pomp and show, and a numerous retinue rather than in convenience and true pleasure. The Earl of Nottingham, in his embassy to Spain, was attended by five hundred persons, and the Earl of Hertford, in that to Brussels, carried three hundred gentlemen along with him. Lord Bacon has remarked that the English nobility, in his time, maintained a larger retinue of servants than the nobility of any other nation except perhaps the Polanders. Civil honors, which now hold the first place, were at that time subordinate to the military. The young gentry and nobility were fond of distinguishing themselves by arms. The fury of duels, too, prevailed more than at any time before or since, and this was the turn that the romantic chivalry for which the nation was formerly so renowned, had lately taken. Liberty of commerce between the sexes was indulged, but without any licentiousness of manners. The court was very little an exception to this observation. James had rather entertained an aversion and contempt for the females, nor were those young courtiers 
of whom he was so fond, able to break through the established manners of the nation. The first sedan chair seen in England was in this reign, and was used by the Duke of Buckingham, to the great indignation of the people who exclaimed that he was employing his fellow creatures to do the service of beasts. The country life prevails at present in England beyond any cultivated nation in Europe, but it was then much more generally embraced by all the gentry. The increase of arts, pleasures, and social commerce was just beginning to produce an inclination for the softer and more civilized life of the city. James discouraged as much as possible this alteration of manners. He was wont to be very earnest, as Lord Bacon tells us, with the country gentlemen to go from London to their county seats, and sometimes he would say thus to them, Gentlemen, at London you are like ships in a sea, which show like nothing, but in your country villages you are like ships in a river, which look like great things. He was not content with reproof and exhortation. As Queen Elizabeth had perceived with regret the increase of London, and had restrained all new buildings by proclamation, James, who found these edicts were not exactly obeyed, frequently renewed them, though a strict execution seems still to have been wanting. He also issued reiterated proclamations in imitation of his predecessor, containing severe menaces against the gentry who lived in town. This policy is contrary to that which has ever been practiced by all princes who studied the increase of their authority. To allure the nobility to court, to engage them in expensive pleasures or employments, which dissipate their fortunes, to increase their subjection to ministers by attendance, to weaken their authority in the provinces by absence, these have been the common arts of arbitrary government. But James, besides that he had certainly laid no plan for extending his powers, had no money to support a splendid court or bestow on a numerous retinue of gentry and nobility. He thought, too, that by their living together they became more sensible of their own strength and were apt to indulge too curious researches into the matters of government. To remedy the present evil, he was desirous of dispersing them into their country seats, where he hoped they would bear a more submissive reverence to his authority and receive less support from each other. But the contrary effect soon followed. The riches amassed during their residence at home rendered them independent. The influence acquired by hospitality made them formidable. They would not be led by the court. They could not be driven. And thus the system of the English government received a total and a sudden alteration in the course of less than forty years. The first rise of commerce and the arts had contributed in preceding reigns to scatter those immense fortunes of the barons which rendered them so formidable both to king and people. The further progress of these advantages began during this reign to ruin the small proprietors of land, and by both events the gentry, or that rank which composed the House of Commons, enlarged their power and authority. The early improvements in luxury were seized by the greater nobles, whose fortunes, placing them above frugality or even calculation, were soon dissipated in expensive pleasures. These improvements reached at last all men of property, and those of slender fortunes, who at that time were often men of family, imitating those of a rank immediately above them, reduced themselves to poverty. Their lands coming to sale swelled the estates of those who possessed riches sufficient for the fashionable expenses, but who were not exempted from some care and attention to their domestic economy. The gentry also of that age were engaged in no expense except that of country hospitality. No taxes were levied, no wars waged, no attendance at court expected, no bribery or profusion required at elections. Could human nature ever reach happiness, the condition of the English gentry, under so mild and benign a prince, might merit that appellation. The amount of the king's revenue, as it stood in 1617, is thus stated. Of crown lands, 80,000 pounds a year, by customs and new impositions, near 190,000, by wards and other various branches of revenue, besides purveyance, 180,000, 
the whole amounting to four hundred and fifty thousand the king's ordinary disbursements by the same account are said to exceed this sum by thirty six thousand pounds all the extraordinary sums which james had raised by subsidies loans sale of lands sale of the title of baronet money paid by the states and by the king of france benevolences etc were in the whole about two millions two hundred thousand pounds of which the sale of lands afforded seven hundred and seventy five thousand pounds the extraordinary disbursements of the king amounted to two million besides above four hundred thousand pounds given in presents upon the whole a sufficient reason appears partly from necessary expenses partly for want of a rigid economy why the king even early in his reign was deeply involved in debt and found great difficulty to support his government farmers not commissioners levied the customs it seems indeed requisite that the former method should always be tried before the latter though a preferable one when men's own interest is concerned they fall upon a hundred expedients to prevent frauds in the merchants and these the public may afterwards imitate in establishing proper rules for its officers the customs were supposed to amount to five per cent of the value and were levied upon exports as well as imports nay the imposition upon exports by james additions is said to amount in some few instances to twenty five per cent this practice so hurtful to industry prevails still in france spain and most countries of europe the customs in sixteen o four yielded one hundred and twenty seven thousand pounds a year they rose to one hundred and ninety thousand towards the end of the reign interest during this reign was at ten per cent till sixteen twenty four and then it was reduced to eight this high interest is an indication of the great profits and small progress of commerce the extraordinary supplies granted by parliament during this whole reign amounted not to more than six hundred and thirty thousand pounds which divided among twenty-one years makes thirty thousand pounds a year i do not include those supplies amounting to three hundred thousand pounds which were given to the king by his last parliament these were paid into their own commissioners and the expenses of the spanish war were much more than sufficient to exhaust them the distressed family of the palatine was a great burden on james during part of his reign the king it is pretended possessed not frugality proportioned to the extreme narrowness of his revenue splendid equipages however he did not affect nor costly furniture nor a luxurious table nor a prodigal mistress his buildings too were not sumptuous though the banqueting house must not be forgotten as a monument which does honour to his reign hunting was his chief amusement the cheapest pleasure in which a king can indulge himself his expenses were the effects of liberality rather than luxury one day it is said while he was standing amidst some of his courtiers a porter passed by loaded with money which he was carrying to the treasury the king observed that rich afterwards earl of holland one of his handsome agreeable favourites whispered something to one standing near him upon inquiry he found that rich had said how happy would that money make me without hesitation james bestowed it all upon him though it amounted to three thousand pounds he added you think yourself very happy in obtaining so large a sum but i am more happy in having an opportunity of obliging a worthy man whom i love the generosity of james was more the result of a benign humour or light fancy than of reason or judgment the objects of it were such as could render themselves agreeable to him in his loose hours not such as were endowed with great merit or who possessed talents or popularity which could strengthen his interest with the public the same advantage we may remark over the people which the crown formerly reaped from that interval between the fall of the peers and the rise of the commons was now possessed by the people against the crown during the continuance of a like interval the sovereign had already lost that independent revenue by which he could subsist without regular supplies from parliament and he had not yet acquired the means of influencing those assemblies the effect of this situation 
which commenced with the accession of the house of stuart soon rose to a great height and were more or less propagated throughout all the reigns of that unhappy family subsidies and fifteenths are frequently mentioned by historians but neither the amount of these taxes nor the method of levying them have been well explained it appears that the fifteenths formerly corresponded to the name and were that proportionable part of the movables but a valuation having been made in the reign of edward the third that valuation was always adhered to and each town paid unalterably a particular sum which the inhabitants themselves assessed upon their fellow citizens the same tax in corporate towns was called a tenth because there it was at first a tenth of the movables the whole amount of a tenth and a fifteenth throughout the kingdom or a fifteenth as it is often more concisely called was about twenty nine thousand pounds the amount of a subsidy was not invariable like that of a fifteenth in the eighth of elizabeth a subsidy amounted to one hundred and twenty thousand pounds in the fortieth it was not above seventy eight thousand it afterwards fell to seventy thousand and was continually decreasing the reason is easily collected from the method of levying it we may learn that the subsidy bills that one subsidy was given for four shillings in a pound on land two shillings and an eight pence on movables throughout the counties a considerable tax had it been strictly levied but this was only the ancient state of a subsidy during the reign of james there was not paid the twentieth part of that sum the tax was so far personal that a man paid only in the county where he lived though he should possess estates in other counties and the assessors formed a loose estimation of his property and rated him accordingly to preserve however some rule in the estimation it seems to have been the practice to keep an eye to former assessments and to rate every man according as his ancestors or men of such an estimated property were accustomed to pay this was a sufficient reason why subsidies could not increase notwithstanding the great increase of money and rise of rents but there was an evident reason why they continually decreased the favor as it is natural to suppose ran always against the crown especially during the latter end of elizabeth when subsidies became numerous and frequent and the sums levied were considerable compared to former supplies the assessors though accustomed to have an eye on ancient estimations were not bound to observe any such rule but might rate anew any person according to his present income when rents fell or parts of an estate were sold off the proprietor was sure to represent these losses and obtain a diminution of his subsidy but where rents rose or new lands were purchased he kept his own secret and paid no more than formerly the advantage therefore of every change was taken against the crown and the crown could obtain the advantage of none and to make the matter worse the alterations which happened in property during this age were in general unfavorable to the crown the small proprietors or twenty pound men went continually to decay and when their estates were swallowed up by a greater the new purchaser increased not his subsidy so loose indeed is the whole method of rating subsidies that the wonder was not how the tax should continually diminish but how it yielded any revenue at all it became at last so unequal and uncertain that the parliament was obliged to change it into a land tax the price of corn during this reign and that of other necessaries of life was no lower or was rather higher than at present by a proclamation of james establishing public magazines whenever wheat fell below thirty-two shillings a quarter rye below eighteen barley below sixteen the commissioners were empowered to purchase corn for the magazines these prices then are to be regarded as low though they would rather pass for high by our present estimation the usual bread of the poor was at this time made of barley the best wool during the quarter part of james reign was at least thirty-three shillings a tod 
At present it is not above two-thirds of that value, though it is to be presumed that our exports in woolen goods are somewhat increased. The finer manufacturers, too, by the progress of arts and industry, have rather diminished in price, notwithstanding the great increase in money. In Shakespeare, the hostess tells Falstaff that the shirts she bought him were Holland at eight shillings a yard, a high price in this day, even supposing, what is not probable, that the best Holland at that time was equal in goodness to the best that can now be purchased. In like manner, a yard of velvet about the middle of Elizabeth's reign was valued at two and twenty shillings. It appears from Dr. Birch's Life of Prince Henry that the prince, by contract with his butcher, paid near a groat a pound throughout the year for all the beef and mutton used in his family. Besides, we must consider that the general turn of that age, which no laws could prevent, was the converting of arable land into pasture. A certain proof that the latter was found more profitable, and consequently that all butcher's meat as well as bread was rather higher than at present. We have a regulation of the market which regard to poultry and some other articles very early in Charles I's reign, and the prices are high. A turkey cock four shillings and sixpence, a turkey hen three shillings, a pheasant cock six, a pheasant hen five, a partridge one shilling, a goose two, a capon two and sixpence, a pullet one and sixpence, a rabbit eight pence, a dozen of pigeons six shillings. We must consider that London at present is more than three times more populous than it was at that time a circumstance which much increases the price of poultry and of everything that cannot conveniently be brought from a distance, not to mention that these regulations by authority are always calculated to diminish, never to increase the market prices. The contractors for victualling the navy were allowed by government eight pence a day for the diet of each man when in harbor, seven and a half penny when at sea, which would suffice at present. The chief difference in expense between that age and the present consists in the imaginary wants of men, which have since extremely multiplied. These are the principal reasons why James' revenue would go no further than the same money in our time, though the difference is not near so great as is usually imagined. End of section 62 Appendix of the Reign of James I Part 2 Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 63 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume Volume 1D Section 63 Appendix to the Reign of James I Part 3 The public was entirely free from the danger and expense of a standing army. While James was vaunting his divine vicegerency and boasting of his high prerogative, he possessed not so much as a single regiment of guards to maintain his extensive claims, a sufficient proof that he sincerely believed his pretensions to be well grounded, and a strong presumption that they were at least built on what were then deemed plausible arguments. The militia of England, amounting to one hundred and sixty thousand men, was the sole defense of the kingdom. It is pretended that they were kept in good order during his reign. The city of London procured officers who had served abroad and who taught the trained bands their exercises in artillery garden, a practice which had been discontinued since 1588. All the counties of England, in emulation of the capital, were fond of showing a well-ordered and well-appointed militia. It appeared that the natural propensity of men towards military shows and exercises will go far 
with a little attention in the sovereign towards exciting and supporting this spirit in any nation the very boys at this time in mimicry of their elders enlisted themselves voluntarily into companies elected officers and practised the discipline of which the models were every day exposed to their view sir edward harwood in a memorial composed at the beginning of the subsequent reign says that england was so unprovided with horses fit for war that two thousand men could not possibly be mounted throughout the whole kingdom at present the breed of horses is so much improved that almost all those which are employed either in the plough wagon or coach would be fit for that purpose the disorders of ireland obliged james to keep up some forces there and put him to great expense the common pay of a private man in the infantry was eight pence a day a lieutenant two shillings an ensign eighteen pence the armies in europe were not near so numerous during that age and the private men we may observe were drawn from a better rank than at present and approaching nearer to that of the officers in the year fifteen eighty three there was a general review made of all the men in england capable of bearing arms and these were found to amount to one million one hundred and seventy two thousand men according to raleigh it is impossible to warrant the exactness of this computation or rather we may fairly presume it to be somewhat inaccurate but if it approached near the truth england was probably since that time increased in populousness the growth of london in riches and beauty as well as in number of inhabitants has been prodigious from sixteen hundred it doubled every forty years and consequently in sixteen eighty it contained four times as many inhabitants as at the beginning of the century it has ever been the centre of all the trade in the kingdom and almost the only town that affords society and amusement the affection which the english bear to a country life makes the provincial towns to be little frequented by the gentry nothing but the allurements of the capital which is favoured by the residence of the king and by being the seat of government and of all the courts of justice can prevail over their passion for their rural villas london at this time was almost entirely built of wood and in every respect was certainly a very ugly city the earl of arundel first introduced the general practice of brick buildings the navy of england was esteemed formidable in elizabeth's time and yet it consisted only of thirty-three ships besides pinnaces and the largest of these would not equal one-fourth rates at present raleigh advises never to build a ship of war above six hundred tons james was not negligent of the navy in five years preceding sixteen twenty three he built ten new ships and expended fifty thousand pounds a year on the fleet by raleigh's account in his discourse of the first invention of shipping the fleet in the twenty-fourth of the queen consisted only of thirteen ships and was augmented afterwards eleven he probably reckoned some to be pinnaces which coke called ships besides the value of thirty-six thousand pounds in timber which he annually gave from the royal forests the largest ship that ever had come from the english docks was built during this reign she was only one thousand four hundred tons and carried sixty-four guns the merchant ships in cases of necessity were instantly converted into ships of war the king affirmed to the parliament that the navy had never before been in so good a condition every session of parliament during this reign we meet with grievous lamentations concerning the decay of trade and the growth of popery such violent propensity have men to complain of the present times and to entertain discontent against their fortune and condition the king himself was deceived by these popular complaints and was at a loss to account for the total want of money which he heard so much exaggerated it may however be affirmed 
that during no preceding period of English history was there a more sensible increase than during the reign of this monarch of all the advantages which distinguish a flourishing people. Not only the peace which he maintained was favorable to industry and commerce, his turn of mind inclined him to promote the peaceful arts, and trade being as yet in its infancy, all additions to it must have been the more evident to every eye which was not blinded by melancholy prejudices. By an account which seems judicious and accurate, it appears that all the seamen employed in the merchant service amounted to ten thousand men, which probably exceeds not the fifth part of their present number. Sir Thomas Overbury says that the Dutch possessed three times more shipping than the English, but that their ships were of inferior burden to those of the latter. Sir William Monson computed the English naval power to be little or nothing inferior to the Dutch, which is surely an exaggeration. The Dutch at this time traded to England with six hundred ships, England to Holland with sixty only. A catalogue of the manufacturers for which the English were then eminent would appear very contemptible in comparison of those which flourish among them at present. Almost all the more elaborate and curious arts were only cultivated abroad, particularly in Italy, Holland, and the Netherlands. Shipbuilding and the founding of iron cannon were the soul in which the English excelled. They seem, indeed, to have possessed alone the secret of the latter, and great complaints were made every parliament against the exportation of English ordnance. Nine-tenths of the commerce of the kingdom consisted in woolen goods. Wool, however, was allowed to be exported till the nineteenth of the king. Its exportation was then forbidden by proclamation, though that edict was never strictly executed. Most of the cloth was exported raw, and was dyed and dressed by the Dutch, who gained, it is pretended, seven hundred thousand pounds a year by this manufacture. A proclamation issued by the king against exporting cloth in that condition had succeeded so ill during one year by the refusal of the Dutch to buy the dress cloth that great murmurs arose against it, and this measure was retracted by the king and complained of by the nation, as if it had been the most impolitic in the world. It seems indeed to have been premature. In so little credit was the fine English cloth even at home, that the king was obliged to seek expedients by which he might engage the people of fashion to wear it. The manufacture of fine linen was totally unknown in the kingdom. The company of merchant adventurers, by their patent, possessed the sole commerce of woolen goods, though the staple commodity of the kingdom. An attempt made during the reign of Elizabeth to lay open this important trade had been attended with bad consequences for a time by a conspiracy of the merchant adventurers not to make any purchases of cloth, and the queen immediately restored them their patent. It was the groundless fear of a like accident that enslaved the nation to the more exclusive companies which confined so much every branch of commerce and industry. The Parliament, however, annulled in the third of the king the patent of the Spanish company and the trade to Spain, which was at first very insignificant, soon became the most considerable in the kingdom. It is strange that they were not thence encouraged to abolish all the other companies, and that they went no further than obliging them to enlarge their bottom and to facilitate the admission of new adventurers. A board of trade was erected by the king in 1622. One of the reasons assigned in the commission is to remedy the low price of wool which begat complaints of the decay of the woolen manufactory. It is more probable, however, that this fall of prices proceeded from the increase of wool. The king likewise recommends it to the commissioners to inquire and examine whether a greater freedom of trade and an exemption from the restraint of exclusive companies would not be beneficial. Men were then fettered by their own prejudices, and the king was justly afraid of embracing a bold measure whose consequences might be uncertain. 
the digesting of a navigation act of a like nature with the famous one executed afterwards by the republican parliament is likewise recommended to the commissioners the arbitrary powers then commonly assumed by the privy council appear evidently through the whole tenor of the commission the silk manufacture had no footing in england but by james direction mulberry trees were planted and silkworms introduced the climate seems unfavorable to the success of this project the planting of hops increased much in england during this reign greenland is thought to have been discovered about this period and the whale fishery was carried on with success but the industry of the dutch in spite of all opposition soon deprived the english of this source of riches a company was erected for the discovery of the northwest passage and many fruitless attempts were made for that purpose in such noble projects despair ought never to be admitted to the absolute impossibility of success be fully ascertained the passage to the east indies had been opened to the english during the reign of elizabeth but the trade to those parts was not entirely established till this reign when the east india company received a new patent enlarged their stock to one million five hundred thousand pounds and fitted out several ships on these adventures in sixteen o nine they built a vessel of twelve hundred tons the largest merchant ship that england had ever known she was unfortunate and perished by shipwreck in sixteen eleven a large ship of the company assisted by a pinnace maintained five several engagements with a squadron of portuguese and gained a complete victory over forces much superior during the following years the dutch company was guilty of great injuries towards the english in expelling many of their factors and destroying their settlements but these violences were resented with a proper spirit by the court of england a naval force was equipped under the earl of oxford and lay in wait for the return of the dutch east india fleet by reason of crossed winds oxford failed of his purpose and the dutch escaped some time after one rich ship was taken by vice admiral merwin and it was stipulated by the dutch to pay seventy thousand pounds to the english company in consideration of the losses which that company had sustained but neither this stipulation nor the fear of reprisal nor the sense of that friendship which subsisted between england and the states could restrain the avidity of the dutch company or render them equitable in their proceedings towards their allies impatient to have sole possession of the spice trade which the english then shared with them they assumed a jurisdiction over a factory of the latter in the island of amboyna on very improbable and even absurd pretenses seized all the factors with their families and put them to death with the most inhuman tortures this dismal news arrived in england at the time when james by the prejudices of his subjects and the intrigues of his favorite were constrained to make a breach with spain and he was obliged after some remonstrances to acquiesce in this indignity from a state whose alliance was now become necessary to him it is remarkable that the nation almost without a murmur submitted to this injury from their protestant confederates an injury which besides the horrid enormity of the action was of much deeper importance to the national interest than all those which they were so impatient to resent from the house of austria the exports of england from christmas sixteen twelve to christmas sixteen thirteen are computed at two million four hundred and eighty seven thousand four hundred and thirty five pounds the imports at two million one hundred and forty one thousand one hundred and fifty one so that the balance in favor of england was three hundred and forty six thousand two hundred and eighty four but in sixteen twenty two the exports were two million three hundred and twenty thousand four hundred and thirty six pounds the imports two million six hundred and nineteen thousand three hundred and fifteen which makes a balance of two hundred and ninety eight thousand eight hundred and seventy nine pounds against england the coinage of england from fifteen ninety nine to sixteen nineteen amounted to four millions 
779,314 pounds, 13 shillings and 4 pence, a proof that the balance, in the main, was considerably in favor of the kingdom. As the annual imports and exports together rose to near 5 millions, and the customs never yielded so much as 200,000 pounds a year, of which tonnage made a part, it appears that the new rates affixed by James did not on the whole amount to one shilling in the pound, and consequently were still inferior to the intention of the original grant of Parliament. The East India Company usually carried out a third of their cargo in commodities. The trade to Turkey was one of the most gainful to the nation. It appears that copper halfpence and farthings began to be coined in this reign. Tradesmen's had commonly carried on their retail businesses, chiefly by means of leaden tokens. The small silver penny was soon lost, and at this time was nowhere to be found. What chiefly renders the reign of James memorable is the commencement of the English colonies in America, colonies established on the noblest footing that has been known in any age or nation. The Spaniards, being the first discoverers of the New World, immediately took possession of the precious mines which they found there, and by the allurement of great riches they were tempted to depopulate their own country as well as that which they conquered, and added the vice of sloth to those of avity and barbarity which had attended their ventures in those renowned enterprises. That fine coast was entirely neglected, which reaches from St. Augustine to Cape Breton, and which lies in all the temperate climates, is watered by noble rivers and offers a fertile soil, but nothing more to the industrious planter. Peopled gradually from England by the necessitous and indigent, who at home increased neither wealth nor populousness. The colonies which were planted along that track have promoted the navigation, encouraged the industry, and even perhaps multiplied the inhabitants of their mother country. The spirit of independency, which was reviving in England, here shone forth in its full luster, and received new accession from the aspiring character of those who, being discontented with the established church and monarchy, had sought for freedom amidst those savage deserts. End of section 63. Appendix to the Reign of James I. Part 3. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 64 of Volume 1D of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume Volume 1D, Section 64 Appendix to the Reign of James I, Part 4 Queen Elizabeth had done little more than given a name to the continent of Virginia, and after her planting one feeble colony, which quickly decayed, that country was entirely abandoned. But when peace put an end to the military enterprises against Spain, and left ambitious spirits no hopes of making any longer such rapid advances towards honor and fortune, the nation began to second the pacific intentions of its monarch, and to seek a surer though slower expedient for acquiring riches and glory. In 1606, Newport carried over a colony, and began a settlement, which the company, erected by patent for that purpose in London and Bristol, took care to supply with yearly recruits of provisions, utensils, and new inhabitants. About 1609, Argall discovered a more direct and shorter passage to Virginia, and left the track of the ancient navigators who had first directed their course southwards to the tropics, sailed westwards by means of the trade winds, and then turned northwards till they reached the English settlements. The same year, five hundred persons under Sir Thomas Gates and Sir George Somers were embarked for Virginia. Somers' ships, meeting with a tempest, was driven into the Bermudas, and laid the foundation of a settlement in those islands. 
Lord Delaware afterwards undertook the government of the English colonies, but notwithstanding all his care, seconded by supplies from James and by money raised from the first lottery ever known in the kingdom, such difficulties attended the settlement of these countries that in 1614 there were not alive more than 400 men of all that had been sent thither. After supplying themselves with provisions more immediately necessary for the support of life, the new planters began the cultivating of tobacco. And James, notwithstanding his antipathy to that drug, which he affirmed to be pernicious to men's morals as well as their health, gave them permission to enter it in England, and he inhibited by proclamation all importation of it from Spain. By degrees, new colonies were established in that continent, and gave new names to the places where they settled, leaving that of Virginia to the province first planted. The island of Barbados was also planted in this reign. Speculative reasoners during that age raised many objections to the planning of those remote colonies, and foretold that, after draining their mother country of inhabitants, they would soon shake off her yoke and erect an independent government in America. But time has shown that the views entertained by those who encouraged such generous undertakings were more just and solid. A mild government and a great naval force have preserved and may still preserve during some time the dominion of England over her colonies. And such advantages have commerce and navigation reaped from these establishments that more than a fourth of the English shipping is at present computed to be employed in carrying on the traffic with the American settlements. Agriculture was anciently very imperfect in England. The sudden transitions so often mentioned by historians from the lowest to the highest price of grain, and the prodigious inequality of its value in different years, are sufficient proofs that the produce depended entirely on the seasons, and that art had as yet done nothing to fence against the injuries of the heavens. During this reign, considerable improvements were made, as in most arts, so in this the most beneficial of any. A numerous catalogue might be formed of books and pamphlets treating of husbandry, which were written about this time. The nation, however, was still dependent on foreigners for daily bread, and though its exportation of grain forms a considerable branch of its commerce, notwithstanding its probable increase of people, there was in that period a regular importation from the Baltic as well as from France and if it ever stopped the bad consequences were sensibly felt by the nation sir walter raleigh in his observations computes that two millions went out at one time for corn it was not till the fifth of elizabeth that the exportation of corn had been allowed in england and camden observes that agriculture from that moment received new life and vigour the endeavors of James, or more properly speaking, those of the nation for promoting trade, were attended with greater success than those for the encouragement of learning. Though the age was by no means destitute of eminent writers, a very bad taste in general prevailed during that period, and the monarch himself was not a little infected with it. On the origin of letters among the Greeks, the genius of poets and orators as might naturally be expected, was distinguished by an amiable simplicity, which whatever rudeness may sometimes attend it, is so fitted to express the genuine movements of nature and passion, that the compositions possessed of it must ever appear valuable to the discerning part of mankind. The glaring figures of discourse, the pointed antithesis, the unnatural conceit, the jingle of words, such false ornaments were not employed by early writers, not because they were rejected, but because they scarcely ever occurred to them. An easy, unforced strain of sentiments runs through their compositions, though at the same time we may observe that amidst the most elegant simplicity of thought and expression, one is sometimes surprised to meet with a poor conceit which had presented itself unsought for and which the author had not acquired critical observation enough to condemn. A bad taste seizes with avidity 
these frivolous beauties, and even perhaps a good taste, ere surfeited by them, they multiply every day more and more in the fashionable compositions. Nature and good sense are neglected, labored ornaments studied and admired, and a total degeneracy of style and language prepares the way for barbarism and ignorance. Hence the Asiatic manner was found to depart so much from the simple purity of Athens, hence that tinsel eloquence which is observable in many of the Roman writers, from which Cicero himself is not wholly exempted, and which so much prevails in Ovid, Seneca, Lucian, Martial, and the Plinies. On the revival of letters, when the judgment of the public is yet raw and unformed, this false glitter catches the eye, and leaves no room, either in eloquence or poetry, for the durable beauties of solid sense and lively passion. The reigning genius is then diametrically opposite to that which prevails on the first origins of arts. The Italian writers, it is evident, even the most celebrated, have not reached the proper simplicity of thought and composition, and in Petrarch, Tasso, Guarneri, frivolous witticisms and forced conceits are but too predominant. The period during which letters were cultivated in Italy was so short as scarcely to allow leisure for correcting this adulterated relish. The more early French writers are liable to the same reproach. Fouetour, Balzac, even Corneille have too much affected those ambitious ornaments of which the Italians in general and least pure of the ancients supplied them with so many models. And it was not till late that observation and reflection gave rise to a more natural turn of thought and composition among that elegant people. A like character may be extended to the first English writers, such as flourished during the reigns of Elizabeth and James, and even till long afterwards. Learning, on its revival in this island, was attired in the same unnatural garb which it wore at the time of its decay among the Greek and Romans. And what may be regarded as a misfortune, the English writers were possessed of great genius before they were endowed with any degree of taste, and by that means gave a kind of sanction to those forced turns and sentiments which they so much affected. Their distorted conceptions and expressions are attended with such vigor of mind that we admire the imagination which produced them, as much as we blame the want of judgment which gave them admittance. To enter into an exact criticism of the writers of that age would exceed our present purpose. A short character of the most eminent delivered with the same freedom which history exercises over kings and ministers may not be improper. The national prepossessions which prevail will perhaps render the former liberty not the least perilous for the author. If Shakespeare be considered as a man, born in a rude age, and educated in the lowest manner, without any instruction either from the world or from books, he may be regarded as a prodigy. If represented as a poet capable of furnishing a proper entertainment to a refined or intelligent audience, we must abate much of this eulogy. In his compositions, we regret that many irregularities and even absurdities should so frequently disfigure the animated and passionate scenes intermixed with them, and at the same time, we perhaps admire the more those beauties on account of their being surrounded with such deformities. A striking peculiarity of sentiment adapted to a singular character, he frequently hits, as it were by inspiration, but a reasonable propriety of thought he cannot for any time uphold. Nervous and picturesque expressions, as well as descriptions, abound in him, but it is in vain we look either for purity or simplicity of diction. His total ignorance of all theatrical art and conduct, however material a defect, yet as it affects the spectator rather than the reader, we can more easily excuse than that want of taste which often prevails in his productions, and which gives way only by intervals to the irradiations of genius. A great and fertile genius he certainly possessed, and one enriched equally with a tragic and comic vein, but he ought to be cited as a proof 
how dangerous it is to rely on these advantages alone for attaining an excellence in the finer arts. And there may even remain a suspicion that we overrate, if possible, the greatness of his genius, in the same manner as bodies often appear more gigantic on account of their being disproportioned and misshapen. He died in 1616, aged 53 years. Johnson possessed all the learning which was wanting to Shakespeare, and wanted all the genius of which the other was possessed. Both of them were equally deficient in taste and elegance, in harmony and correctness. A servile copyist of the ancients, Johnson translated into bad English the beautiful passages of Greek and Roman authors, without accommodating them to the manners of his age and country. His merit has been totally eclipsed by that of Shakespeare, whose rude genius prevailed over the rude art of his contemporary. The English theatre has ever taken a strong tincture of Shakespeare's spirit and character, and thence it has proceeded that the nation has undergone from all its neighbors the reproach of barbarism from which its valuable productions in some other part of learning would otherwise have exempted it. Johnson had a pension of a hundred marks from the king, which Charles afterwards augmented to a hundred pounds. He died in 1637, aged 63. Fairfax has translated Tasso with an elegance and ease, and at the same time with an exactness which for that age are surprising. Each line in the original is faithfully rendered by a correspondent line in the translation. Harrington's translation of Ariosto is not likewise without its merit. It is to be regretted that these poets should have imitated the Italians in their stanza, which has a prolixity and uniformity in it that displeases in long performances. They had otherwise, as well as Spencer, who went before them, contributed much to the polishing and refining of the English versification. In Dunn's satires, when carefully inspected, there appear some flashes of wit and ingenuity, but these totally suffocated and buried by the harshest and most uncouth expression that is anywhere to be met with. If the poetry of the English was so rude and imperfect during that age, we may reasonably expect that their prose would be liable to still greater objections. Though the latter appears the more easy, as it is the more natural method of composition. It has ever in practice been found the more rare and difficult, and there scarcely is an instance in any language that it has reached a degree of perfection before the refinement of poetical numbers and expression. English prose during the reign of James was written with little regard to the rules of grammar and with a total disregard to the elegance and harmony of the period. Stuffed with Latin sentences and quotations, it likewise imitated those inventions which, however forcible and graceful in the ancient languages, are entirely contrary to the idiom of English. I shall indeed venture to affirm that whatever uncouth phrases and expressions occur in old books, they are chiefly owing to the unformed taste of the author, and that the language spoken in the courts of Elizabeth and James was very little different from that which we meet with at present in good company. Of this opinion, the little scraps of speeches which are found in the parliamentary journals, and which carry all air so opposite to the labored rations, seem to be a sufficient proof, and there want not productions of that age, which being written by men who were not authors by profession, retain a very natural manner, and may give us some idea of the language which prevailed among the men of the world. I shall particularly mention Sir John Davis's discovery, Throgmorton's, Essex's, and Neville's letters. In a more early period, Cavendish's life of Cardinal Wolseley, the pieces that remain of Bishop Gardiner's and Anne Boleyn's letter to the king, differ little or nothing from the language of our time. The great glory of literature in this island during the reign of James was Lord Bacon. Most of his performances were composed in Latin, though he possessed neither the elegance of that nor of his native tongue. 
if we consider the variety of talents displayed by this man as a public speaker, a man of business, a wit, a courtier, a companion, an author, a philosopher, he is justly the object of great admiration. If we consider him merely as an author and philosopher, the light in which we view him at present, though very estimable, he was yet inferior to his contemporary Galileo, perhaps even to Kepler. Bacon pointed out, at a distance, the road to true philosophy. Galileo both pointed it out to others and made himself considerable advances in it. The Englishman was ignorant of geometry. The Florentine revived that science, excelled in it, and was the first that applied it, together with experiment, to natural philosophy. The former rejected, with the most positive disdain, the system of Copernicus. The latter fortified it with new proofs, derived both from reason and the senses. Bacon's style is stiff and rigid. His wit, though often brilliant, is also often unnatural and far-fetched, and he seems to be the original of those pointed similes and long-spun allegories which so much distinguish the English authors. Galileo is a lively and agreeable, though somewhat a prolix writer. But Italy not united in any single government, and perhaps satiated with that literary glory which it has possessed both in ancient and modern times, has too much neglected the renown which it has acquired by giving birth to so great a man. That national spirit which prevails among the English and which forms their great happiness, is the cause why they bestow on all their eminent writers, and on Bacon among the rest, such praises and acclamations as may often appear partial and excessive. He died in 1626, in the sixty-sixth year of his life. If the reader of Raleigh's history can have the patience to wade through the Jewish and rabbinical learning which compose the half of the volume, he will find, when he comes to the Greek and Roman story, that his pains were not unrewarded. Raleigh is the best model of that ancient style which some writers would affect to revive at present. He was beheaded in 1618, aged 66 years. Camden's History of Queen Elizabeth may be esteemed good composition, both for style and matter. It is written with simplicity of expression, very rare in that age, and with a regard to truth. It would not, perhaps, be too much to affirm that it is among the best historical productions which have yet been composed by an Englishman. It is well known that the English have not much excelled in that kind of literature. He died in 1623, aged 73 years. We shall mention the king himself at the end of these English writers, because that is his place, when considered as an author. It may safely be affirmed that the mediocrity of James' talents in literature, joined to the great change in national taste, is one cause of that contempt under which his memory labors, and which is often carried by party writers to a great extreme. It is remarkable how different from ours were the sentiments of the ancients with regard to learning. Of the first twenty Roman emperors, counting from Caesar to Severus, about half were authors, and though few of them seem to have been eminent in that profession, it is always remarked to their praise that by their example they encouraged literature. Not to mention Germanicus and his daughter Agrippina, persons so nearly allied to the throne, the greater part of the classic writers whose works remain were men of the highest quality. As every human advantage is attended with inconveniences, the change of men's ideas in this particular may probably be ascribed to the invention of printing, which has rendered books so common that even men of slender fortune can have access to them. That James was but a middling writer may be allowed that he was a contemptible one can by no means be admitted. Whoever will read his Basilicon Doron, particularly the two last books, The True Law of Free Monarchies, his answer to Cardinal Perrin, and almost all his speeches and messages to Parliament, will confess him to have possessed no mean genius. If he wrote concerning witches and apparitions, who in that age did not admit 
the reality of these fictitious beings. If he has composed a contemporary of the revelations and proved the Pope to be Antichrist, may not a similar reproach be extended to the famous Napier and even to Newton at a time when learning was much more advanced than during the reign of James. From the grossness of its superstitions we may infer the ignorance of an age, but never should pronounce concerning the folly of an individual from his admitting popular errors consecrated by the appearance of religion. Such a superiority do the pursuits of literature possess above every other occupation that even he who obtains but a mediocrity in them merits the preeminence above those that excel the most in the common and vulgar professions. The Speaker of the House of Commons is usually an eminent lawyer, yet the harangue of His Majesty will always be found much superior to that of the Speaker in every Parliament during his reign. Every science, as well as polite literature, must be considered as being yet in its infancy. Scholastic learning and polemical divinity retarded the growth of all true knowledge. Sir Henry Saville in the preamble of that deed by which he annexed a salary to mathematical and astronomical professors in Oxford, says that geometry was almost totally abandoned and unknown in England. The best learning of that age was the study of the ancients. Casabon, eminent for this species of knowledge, was invited over from France by James, and encouraged by a pension of three hundred pounds a year, as well as by church preferments. The famous Antonio de Dominis, Archbishop of Spalatro, no despicable philosopher, came likewise into England and afforded great triumph to the nation by their gaining so considerable a proselyte from the Papists. But the mortification followed soon after the Archbishop, though advanced to some ecclesiastical preferments, received not encouragement sufficient to satisfy his ambition, and he made his escape into Italy, where he died in confinement. End of section 64, Appendix to the Reign of James I, Part 4. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington.